Osland was unable to accept the award because he's currently on an overseas assignment for NBN News. He captured the rescue of teenage youths Adam Kane of Lithgow and Gavin Griffiths of Buff Point from a cave at Fraser Park on December the 28th last year. The youth had intended to go spearfishing at Snapper Rock, but a change of plans because of the Wild Sea almost led to disaster. After exploring rocks, they became trapped by a rising tide and sought shelter in a cave. Rescuers were washed into the boiling surf during the rescue bid. The drama ended with a few scratches for the boys in difficulty and a drenching for those who went to their aid. Two other NBN entries were commended in the regional news feature and current affairs section. Journalists Belinda Boriso and cameraman Glenn Cook for their Newsnight feature on Prosthetic Man. And Tracy Reed, who also had Glenn Cook as cameraman, received a commendation for the last cattle drive from Merriwa to Maitland. The judges said entries in this category reflected the trend regional television stations are following toward devoting considerable resources to the development of current affairs programmes. A record number of entries was received for the awards, with more than 360 being judged from 47 metropolitan and regional television stations throughout Australia. Smart stayer Zama Kima has the class to hump 57 kilos and win tomorrow's Services Memorial Cup at Ranwick. The New Zealand bred four-year-old has not raced since his gallant sixth in the Sydney Cup on April 1 and he will be on trial for a start in the Brisbane Cup. Tough Newcastle stayer Copper Tonic, an impressive last start winner at Rose Hill, has a strong chance while the lightly weighted Rebel Yell has claims. For the Ranwick Daily Double, try Southern Sweep and Merry Ruler. Down south, it's the St. Ledger Stakes at Flemington, and Gary Harley feels the triumphal queen can get the money from Port of Biscay, and he throws Val Jean in for third. For the daily double, Gary likes triumphal queen in the first leg, and couples her with Kentucky Babe in the second. The Cessnock race meeting set down for today has been transferred to Broadmeadow tomorrow. The Eagle Farm Anzac Day meeting and the Cessnock Anzac Day program have both been abandoned. The Broadmeadow meeting will be of 10 races, with the first at 12.05. For the trifecta, Gary's numbers are 5, 2 and 1, Zamalong to beat Rocky and Classic Kiwi, and in the legs of the Daily Double, beyond Swift Beat in the first leg and Zamalong in the second, according to G. Harley, NBN's Fearless Tipster. The parade continued on footpaths under the shelter of shopfront awnings. However, the usual memorial service in Civic Park was moved inside the City Hall across the road. There, a gathering of several hundred paid tribute to the fallen during a wreath-laying ceremony. The rain held off long enough for the main Newcastle Anzac march to take place as planned. It was led by a Polish contingent to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the invasion of Poland. It wound its way from the Tug Wharf, past the post office and into Civic Park for a remembrance service. Diggers will disperse to the various RSL clubs and sporting events for the rest of the day, and even the two-up games this year are legal. Firefighters brought out their brooms to scrub down an estimated 200 litres of oil which leaked from a truck following a minor accident. Police closed Harrison Street for about two hours as the clean-up continued. The fire brigade used a dispersing agent called Slixit to cut through the film and Lake Macquarie Council workers also joined the emergency scrub down. A substantial quantity of the oil leaked into drains and officers from the State Pollution Control Commission are making their own inquiries into a possible environmental hazard.
The Tourist Minister's Cup, the feature race at Doombin tomorrow, has attracted an outstanding field. The New Zealander Jean Delar, a shock late scratching from last month's Doncaster, has a strong chance. Jean Delar will have the services of Sydney jockey Darren Beedman and is drawn well in the big field. Sydney siders High Regard and Gracho are very smart and also have undeniable chances. Turning now to Rose Hill, a noted mudlark Magic Gleam is racing in good form at present and has bright prospects in tomorrow's Hardy's All Weather Handicap. Magic Gleam scored brilliantly with 57 kilos on his back in the Gosford Pace Setter Stakes on April 4 and in his previous start was a solid second at Targlish at the Randwick Galaxy on Easter Monday. Trainer Harry Clark will take advantage of apprentice John Powell's 3 kilo weight allowance and Magic Gleam will carry the luxury weight of 555 kilos. At Beaumont Park tomorrow and Gary Harley is tip number 6 Maya card in race 9. That's the first leg of the Daily Double and like a wolf in the second leg. While in the trifecta on race 9, Gary's putting the money on number 6 Maya card, 3 Sparkling May and number 4 Marie's Charity. And at the Cessnock Trots, Gary's gone for number 8 James Brett in race 6 and in race 7 number 1 Mr White in the second leg of the Daily Double. In Gary's trifecta, he's taken race six. He's selected numbers eight, James Brett, number ten, Dusty's Return, and number one, True Dean. Also, racing will be at Musselbrook tomorrow. Eight races with the first getting underway at 12.35. Fire brigades from Newcastle, Tyers and Cooks Hill were called to Gibbs Street around 6.30 tonight. An old weatherboard house was well ablaze by the time they arrived. Inside was an elderly woman, crippled by a recent stroke, unable to escape the blaze. Neighbours desperately tried to get into the house to save her, but were driven back by intense heat. I raced up and there were people already here and I asked was there anybody inside and they said they don't know. So I said, as soon as I seen the, like I was about to the second room then, so I bowled around the back and tried to break the back door down and I tried my heart out but I couldn't get it open, it was still well bolted. And I, I knew I heard someone scream out and that was it, just one scream and that's it. Didn't hear nothing else after that. The woman's elderly husband was out of the house during the fire. Paramedics tried to comfort the distraught man. Firemen are searching for a missing boarder, but they believe he was not in the house at the time. Police are investigating, but so far there are no suspicious circumstances. Land Transport Minister Bob Brown says the Sydney to Newcastle section of the National Highway will continue to be given urgent attention. In the next five years, he says, $230 million will be spent in the Newcastle region on National Highway projects. Approximately $20 million will be for minor works and maintenance. By 1993, Mr Brown says the highway from Freeman's Waterholes to Minmai will be complete and Lenigan's Drive will be upgraded to provide a temporary connection to the New England Highway and easier access to the Pacific Highway. He says this will provide direct access to the highway from northern Newcastle and will enable interstate traffic to bypass Newcastle's main streets. The amount of money as well that we're spending on uh, national roads in this area, in the Hunter this year, represents about 25% of the total money that we're spending on national roads throughout uh, New South Wales. Mr Brown says the road strategy also covers national arterial roads. $36 million will be spent to link the National Highway at West Walls End to the Port of Newcastle and industrial areas at Mayfield and Kurragang Island. He says this will improve access to ports, airports, railheads and production and tourism areas. He says a transport system is needed to make production and exports easier to overcome the current account deficit. Meanwhile, the NRMA says Mr Brown's announcement today is nothing new, but is simply spelling out which roads are to be funded under the Roads Australia program announced by the government earlier this year. 
The organisation says across the board, road funding and construction in New South Wales is grossly behind schedule. And it says there is no doubt the federal government is looking for votes in the Hunter with its announcement today. Is this road funding a ploy to capture more, more of the votes here in the Hunter region? Well, I suppose in a sense all programs that governments uh, carry out will be judged by the electors. And uh, I would hope that the electors will look favourably on this road. Taree, near the mouth of the Manning River, has seen rapid growth in recent years. Now the population of the greater council area tops 38,000. Much of this development has been spearheaded by the council, which is very much behind the sale of Brylite to the United Kingdom giant. Brylite makes electrical switchgear for cars and trucks. Its three large buildings in the centre of town employ 280 people, but the changes will see that number double. Taree town clerk, Charles Chatwood. The council is very much committed to uh promoting and accelerating the economic growth. There's a very good manufacturing base existing at the moment. Uh, a new Manning development board has been put in place to try and create new job opportunities and attract new industries. Uh, this is a very major step forward in that whole uh, objective. For Brytax's part, Brylite had been on the shopping list for some time. The British manufacturer liked what it saw at Taree and decided to buy. Managing Director Tom Cannon. We were looking for a, a company which uh, duplicated the sort of uh, business that we are transacting in Europe and um, through one of our subsidiary companies we were introduced to the Bryant operation uh, and after a few months of negotiation uh, we've arrived at today's deal. It's a big day for Taree, but even more so for Stan Bryant, the chairman of the local companies, who's been involved in three months of secret negotiations. For Mr Bryant, the move was the only way for the company to go. To give us access to research and development, um, and new equipment and technology, and markets over the other side of the equator. Eventually, the inner Taree buildings will be sold. They have already run out of room. A whole new complex will be developed out of town, which by 1992 should double the Brylite workforce. This is the site between Taree and Wingham, which has been reserved for Bryant Industries. It adjoins the Taree City Council's present industrial estate, and the plan had been to subdivide it up into smaller lots for sale in the future. But because of the expansion potential of Bryant Industries, Taree City Council has decided to let it have the whole 17 hectares. The deal concluded today is a complicated one, with the eventual purchase price being based on company performance over the next three years, during which time the vendors, the Bryants, will remain on as managers. People would be forgiven for thinking they'd walked into a session of Parliament. But although the procedures were the same and the noise level familiar, the politicians wore school uniforms. Ninety students from 12 schools in the region took part, debating a bill for an energy plan to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Run in conjunction with Law Week, the mock sitting was designed to make the law system understandable to students. And what better way than putting them in the hot seat of a politician? We've had tremendous gains socially and academically from our students from participating in 1988 and in 1989, an increase in confidence and increase in exposure to the legal system uh, in this state. The students were given six weeks to study the bill. Once equated with the workings of Parliament and the law system, they were allocated sides and titles. The situation was made as real as possible. Like some rowdy sessions, a minister was ejected from Parliament, and with the government having the numbers, the opposition was defeated on all counts. Newcastle Railway executives can't say how much of the government's planned $2 billion injection will come to the Hunter. However, the region's rail service is already preparing for a large-scale upgrading. The changes aim to make the rail service financially viable. 
At the moment, Newcastle users pay $1.3 million for a service which costs $20 million a year. The Newcastle Rail area will become a separate business zone under a general manager. In order to boost business, the network, which extends as far south as Hawkesbury, will be modernised by upgrading rolling stock, signals and ticket collecting systems, and at the same time, staffing levels will be reviewed. A spokesman for the Newcastle Division said deliverable dates are already being drawn up. Later, it will be up to the government to decide which operations are viable, which require funding support and which should be cut. The rail shake-up has also thrown a shadow over the $500 million Tangara rail project. Ganinans have a contract to provide 450 rail cars over the next eight years. 44 have already been delivered. Company Chief Director John Fitzgerald believes delivery of the Tangaras is vital to the government's city rail plans. It's my belief that Tangara is going to be still required, no matter what the conclusions are, for two reasons. The growth in usage of trains in Sydney and the performance criteria this train brings of uh, low uh, requirement for servicing and maintenance, which in itself generates uh, improvements in the SRA operation. just burst through the door, two of them have burst through the door, they've had balaclavas on and one's just stood through the d near the door, the other one's jumped up on the teller's box and handed us bags, told us to fill the bags. It was just after 12.15 when the two armed bandits burst into the Commonwealth Bank at the junction. Guns pointed in the air, they demanded three young bank tellers fill several plastic bags with bundles of money. Were they yelling or screaming yeah, at all? Yeah, just yeah. telling what to get on the things floor. Were they yelling? Yeah. Fill get the bags. Fill the floor and and about five the times. Fill yeah. the bags. Fill the bags and get on the floor. Yeah. And we want the bundles. Give us the bundles. We want the bundles. Then, still screaming, the two bandits ran from the bank into the path of Ralph Masters, a 65 year old former policeman on his way into the bank. A short struggle ensued, then the men broke free, jumping into a white Ford Falcon sedan and speeding away. A short while later, police found that car abandoned in Cooks Hill, inside the striped beanie that one bandit had used to cover his face. The taxi driver revealed the pair were seen diving into a Magna sedan. A quick check revealed that to be a rental car hired to a Cooks Hill address. Police converged on that address to find the car in the basement of a block of flats. Police swarmed on the building and brandishing guns surrounded it. Several detectives entered the building and there began a process of elimination. It was a matter of working through the flats and eliminating those where there were no suspects involved. And, uh, the police struck the right one very early in the, in the search. Almost three quarters of an hour later, detectives emerged from the building with two handcuffed men. It was a peaceful ending to what one policeman later admitted was a very explosive situation. Well, uh, you know, an armed hold-up is always a dangerous situation, and particularly when there's a gun produced at the bank, it uh, makes it more... A short while ago, two men, both from Tweed Heads and aged 26 and 31, were charged with armed robbery, assault occasioning actual bodily harm and car stealing. Ralph Masters will bear the scars of his involvement in the incident for some time. In his struggle with the bandits outside the bank, the 65-year-old former Newcastle Police Superintendent was beaten across the head with a gun by one man and kicked and punched by the other. But despite the danger of such a situation, Mr Masters said his police training simply took control. Yeah, I, I wonder about that because I thought I'd got it out of my system. Um, <laughs> How many years have you been really? out of the force? Now, Six right? years. Six years. I didn't, uh, i got to admit that I, I didn't, when he wanted me to move, I wasn't going to move. Uh, I wasn't prepared to have a go at him, but I was going to delay him as long as I could in case they had some sort of alarm there where the coppers could get there quick as fast. <laughs> It was the beginning of a journey that could end with some of these young bulls becoming the finest breeding stock ever to come out of the hunter. 
Until today, they'd been untamed beasts sent into the hilly scrubland of the Upper Hunter 12 months ago to grow into the strong, proud cattle Wooten is renowned for turning out. The scrubland stint has been a Wooten tradition for 28 years. It's always had good results, but this year, with the excellent grazing conditions, the mob that emerged from that scrubland was almost copybook. It's young beasts like this that are signalling the turnaround in the Australian cattle industry. Studs like Wooten are putting every spare ounce of effort into developing what the overseas markets want. Less fat and more muscle, just like these beasts. And as a result, the Australian cattle industry has never looked brighter. I haven't heard anybody saying anything but uh, good things about the beef industry. And uh, the prospects certainly are as bright now as I've ever seen them. We have the new market in Japan, the new market in Korea, the whole Asian market is on the verge of opening up, and we've got the very strong North American market. So, with the cattle industry looking so rosy right now, what better time for Peter Bishop to announce his plans to make Wooten an even bigger name in the Australian polled Hereford industry than it is now. Presently, it's the nation's seventh largest stud, featuring about 280 breeding females. Last year, it sold just over 110 first-class stud stock at its annual sale. The final figure was an all-time record. Last year, our sale was the... Uh second largest grossing sale in the breed on farm in Australia. Um, I think there's room for improvement eventually. It'll take a while, but uh, we're not looking to stand still. Uh, we've bought six new American bulls this year, or six new sons of American bulls, and um, we expect them to have a profound influence over our herd of Australian cows. The type of confidence that Peter Bishop is feeling in the cattle industry right now is clearly being felt right across the hunter. Last week's scone cattle sales saw prices reach phenomenal records and according to Peter prices are still on their way up. So it seems very likely this herd of young bulls will receive extra special attention over the next few months, which they'll spend being pampered into the sale ring condition in a feeding paddock on the outskirts of Scone. They'll face the sale ring in October at Wooten's annual sale, and already Peter and other top cattlemen are predicting they'll very likely earn themselves a place in Wooten and even the Australian sales record books. Police descended on Perfection Point Manicure Salon shortly after 3.30 this afternoon. It's believed an unidentified client had been receiving a manicure when her bag was taken by another woman who briefly visited the store. The missing bag contained several thousand dollars. Police say a short time after the incident, a woman was arrested by a shop assistant at the Hilltop Plaza. The client's handbag and money was recovered and police were called. Late this evening, detectives were still questioning a 27-year-old Charlestown woman. She was huddled over the bag and I said, are you right? And she just started coming towards us then. And um, she knocked me over and I just grabbed her by the leather jacket and just held her. And then this other girl came running and we've just held, held her and just tried to calm her down a bit. Did she put up any sort of struggle? Yeah. <laughs> but she pushed me into the wall. She just didn't want to be held at all. was an atmosphere to rival any grand final at the International Sports Centre as the Knights reached new heights with a stunning 16-8 win over the Bulldogs. A crowd of 25,840 was officially announced, but quite a few patrons thought there were as many people at yesterday's match as there was at last year's game against the Broncos, and there were 30,200 at that match. And the daily papers had a field day extolling the virtues of the Knights. The Telegraph led their centre page spread with a blazing headline, Day of the Nights, and followed up with a quote from Sam Stewart, the players aren't just playing for themselves, but for the whole city. And when you get that sort of commitment from the team, backed up by some fantastic support, it is easy to see why we are playing well. In this afternoon's Daily Mirror, banner headlines read, Nightmares for Bulldogs, and then followed Alan McMahon saying, This win wasn't just the result of a week's work, it's been coming for a long time. We have all put a lot of time in, everyone has stuck together, it's like a big family. 
A regular sentiment around the community of the Hunter Valley in the past 24 hours is that the Knights, as a team, has instilled a lot of pride to the whole area.